Now, look, here's the thing. This is a psychology show. And I just wanted to take a minute to tell you guys about the psychological benefits of listening to audiobooks, right? Audiobooks can boost your productivity because you're not doing, you're not reading, you're doing other stuff while you're listening. It, you know what? As smart as I am, not to toot my own horn, but I, I don't know how to pronounce some big words sometimes. And so listening to somebody else speak it, you know, it helps me learn them good things. You know, it makes you feel like you're on a journey with someone when they read to you. And oftentimes it's the author. It's super cool, right? So it's almost like a one-sided conversation. Somebody just talking to you. And here's the best part. If you have a student or a young one at home, this model's good interpretive reading, right? They can read along with it. It encourages critical listening, introduces new vocabulary, so this episode is brought to you by Audible.com. Now, keeping all those things in mind that I just said about the psychological benefits of audiobooks, you can go to audibletrial.com slash humanfactorscast, get your free 30-day trial. They'll throw in a free book. Shoot, they'll throw in a free book every month. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash humanfactorscast. Go check them out. Today on the show, Billy and I finished our conversation about displays, because last week we just had so much to talk about, we couldn't fit it all in. So let's get started. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Here are your hosts, Nick Rome and Billy Hall. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. Man, Billy, it feels like forever since we've seen each other. I've missed you, but they say distance makes the heart grow fonder. It's been like, what? Like, not even a couple seconds. We just ended our last podcast because we got so excited about this stuff that it went long, and we just decided to break it up into two parts. I think the actual length of time we had was about five minutes, because you went outside to make a phone call, and I went over there to... I went to the bathroom to take a tinkle. So, so in that five... How, how have you been this last week? Oh, dude, it has been amazing. I, you know... I had these great things that happened here. Insert great things that happened. I've had these challenging things. Insert challenging things that happened. And, you know, I also did have some good times. Insert good times. Are you going to go back and edit the good no, times? No, I'm just kidding things? with you. I'm okay. just messing with you because we've only been separated for five minutes. But, you know, it is what it is. No, it's been a week, <laughs> Billy. What are you talking about, man? <laughs> we already told them that. It's it's only been it's been a week, dude. It's I don't know what you're, you're talking right, about. Here. You're right. You're right. I'm sorry. We got to actually keep up <laughs> the air of disbelief magic. So anyway, uh-huh. What are we uh what are we talking about? We're talking about displays part deuce. Part deuce. Why judgment it... displays. Judgment displays. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute judgment. <laughs> displays. A, two electric boogaloo. Electric boogaloo displays. <laughs> Man. So displays. So right. so what did we talk about last time? We talked about perception displays and mental displays and how they affected when you're looking at design. Mental model. Mental model. Yeah. When we're looking at um, display design. Right? Right. Uh, so last time we went over displays, but... Let's remind ourselves what's a display is, what a display is. Right. So again, mm-hmm. a display device is some sort of output for uh, the presentation of information. And remember, this can be visual, um, tactile, or mm-hmm. auditory. It's basically some way of uh, you know showing present presenting information. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, you even talked a little bit about blind people doing it. Right, right, right. And so we talked about different types, right? Yeah, so we mentioned that there were um, haptic displays with, mm-hmm. like, Braille and uh, different... Like, we, we mentioned the tongue example. Right, right. Glitter boys. Right, if you're just tuning in, please go back and listen to our old podcast because... That taken out of context can mean something else. <laughs> we also talked about auditory displays, and I mentioned a cool story about how... How you were working on that yeah. with the different... Where the sound was coming from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we went over t- the difference between 2D and 3D displays. And, lasers. And lasers! And holograms. Help me... Oh, yeah. Help holograms. Me, help me 
Oh, Billy Kenobi. <laughs> You're my only hope. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, so then we went over the 13 principles of display design on the previous show. Uh, we covered the first seven. Right, right, yeah. Principles. And, yeah. And we got... We got super into it, right? And, right, and right, right. We just, we couldn't cram all this information into one episode. Yeah, we didn't want to rush through it because it's about you guys. Right. I mean, it's, it's a lot of valuable information, especially if you're an aspiring human factors practitioner or if you are a designer or a coder. Someone just working on an app in your free time. Someone in Silicon Valley who's, you know, trying to get some seed money for this uh -huh. product. If you're working on something... Just keeping these things in mind. So we want to make sure we didn't, you know, we want to make sure we give it justice. Right, right. I mean, this thing, it sounds like this kind of idea should be on the tip of everybody's mind throughout the design process of whatever you're doing. Right. Even, I mean, yeah. Whenever whenever you're designing for somebody else or creating something for somebody else, this, this should be right there in the forefront. We always talk about that, the idea of have someone else do your thing. Have someone else use your thing. Utilize people who do UI, UX, and design to make sure that you're not just making, oh, duh, things because that's how your brain is wired. Yeah, and you know what? If you guys are making something and you want us to review it on the show, go ahead and send it to us. I mean, we're all over social media. Give us a comment. Send you know what? If you're making something, you probably don't want the world to see it. Go ahead and send it to us at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. We will review it on the show for you for free. That is some that's, valuable that's compelling. feedback. I mean, you know, we might talk about it if we can, or we'll record it even for later date if you want to keep it under wraps, because we believe in our fans. We do. Just let us know. Uh, go ahead and give us a comment or... Message you know. us on humanfactorscast at gmail.com. Whatever. We're everywhere. Mm -hmm, All definitely, right. Definitely, definitely. So last week, yeah, we, uh, like you said, we covered the perceptual principles mm -hmm. and the mental model principles, right? And, you know, those, those kind of went into, like, how we perceive information and what types of things should we present on the display uh, while, you know, we're looking at it. What, what kind of things are more important and less important, and how we process information that is on the screen. Mm -hmm. And then we also, you know, mentioned these these uh, display principles about mental models, and that's basically how you think about something. Mm -hmm. uh, and and basically, you want to map the the uh, the information to how someone thinks about it. Right. And these were all put out by a guy and his sisters while they were sitting around a pentagram, right? Wiccans. Wiccans. No, not, yeah. Not Wiccans like. Like, mm -hmm. like magic, like... I'm going to find out your dark secret one of these days. <laughs> Wiccans is probably listening to this podcast and like... Uh... It's probably like career suicide right now. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's what's going to happen. Someone's listening to him and is like, I was going to hire that guy. But no, I don't need that kind of black magic around me. <laughs> A Wiccans? What? Are, are you talking about hiring Wiccans? Hiring Wiccans. No, Wiccans. Wiccans is set for life. You think he is? Oh, he's like human factors He royalty. made his... He's, yeah, yeah he's, he he's, made he's, his... He's okay. He's he doing okay for his, himself. Okay. He's doing okay for himself. <laughs> he has a couple of Teslas? Uh, I don't know about that, but he's doing okay for himself. <laughs> All right. So we talked about those last time. Right. There's a couple more uh, design principles, right? And these are principles based on attention. What? What? <laughs> attention. Okay, uh, attention. And then we also have um, principles that serve our memory. Mm hmm I kind of remember that. I see what you're doing. I'm trying. I'm making efforts. <laughs> Chihuahua, I, chain gun. I, I Not all of them are going to work. All right, all right, all right. Someone okay. finds those funny out there. Some Someone... Fi yeah. <laughs> He's like... Someone uh, is laughing at my disdain for your jokes right now, so yeah. that's... <laughs> you know, you decided to invite me to do this. You have other friends. Yeah. But no, no. You just like my plucky attitude and my interest in your work. Mr. Billy Hall, everyone. All right. So let's get into these uh, principles based on attention. Okay. Right? Yeah. Okay. So basically, uh, we're starting at number eight here. So this is minimizing information access cost. Now... What does that mean to you, Billy? Minimizing information access cost. 
Um, well, people have a short attention span, so I would imagine that they wouldn't have to keep track of a lot of information on actions that they have to perceive. Kind of like that old adage that uh, if you're hacking a computer, you have to type in like 30 different lines of code real quick because you're racing against the machine. It's not usually that complicated, right? Right. Yeah, so so this... Yeah, you're right. You're very... You're Yeah. Yeah! I I can't even tell you no anymore. You're yes. you're, you're just getting it. Yeah. So this is basically uh, making uh, making information right like easy to access from from what whatever you're looking at on the display, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you know uh, an example. Can you think of an example? I got one here. I got one written down in the show notes. Don't look at the show notes. Um, can no, I think okay. of an example? Make uh, make information easy. Uh, so, so low, ATMs. low cost, low, t- uh, low, low cost and time and effort. Uh, That's ATMs. what we're looking for here. ATMs. How's you that? can access a lot of information on your bank. You can transfer money by just ha- hitting like two, three buttons and, uh, and, and hitting enter. Um, like for example, when you bring it up, there's usually like four things, you know, it has balance, transfer, uh, withdrawal and deposit. Okay. I want you... Okay, so there's a couple things that are happening with an ATM. That's, uh-huh. that's a good place to go. Okay. So think about an ATM. So one way you can minimize information access cost with an ATM mm-hmm. is you can make the screen really tiny. Right. Okay, the ATM screens are pretty tiny, right? Yeah. This is... Uh, so that way there's not a whole lot of information on it. It's contained to a small area. You don't have to look very far to find the information. The, the cost of accessing information on that screen is very low because you don't have to move your eyes very much, um, you know, and you can kind of place your body in front of it and not have to worry about the person behind you looking at you. Um, another thing that ATMs do, which I don't know if you've noticed, but when, when it spits back out your card, the color on some ATMs, the color around, like the, there's a little light the strip. Slot, yeah. It changes color. Right. Like saying, hey, look at me, look at me. It flashes. Right? And and it's basically saying, you know, that's the most important source of information right now. Get your card before you leave. Right. That information access cost is low because it's it's uh, creating such a big change in the saliency of that signal. Mm-hmm. Saliency? Right? Yeah. The the uh, basically how how prominent it is. Okay. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the plumage of the ATM. So, okay. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> so, I mean, it makes, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. anyway, so, so yeah, no, I mean, the, the fact that it flashes, uh huh, it shows you, you know, hey, look at, look at, look at, look at me, look at me, hey, thank you, thank you, here's your card. Oh, Take oh your card. thank you, thank you, thank you very much. There you go. So that's, that, that would be an example of minimizing that information access cost. You basically want to make it for the user to sort of access this information without having to work too hard. What about the idea that all you, ATMs seem to have, like, a uniformed design? Like, for example, it always has those eight buttons on the side right here. It has the keypad right there. It has the little audio jack if you need to listen to it. Right. It always seems to be, and it always seems to have the same prompts, even though you go to a different bank or a different place. Yeah, so a lot of that has to do with consistency and standards. Mm -hmm. Um, So that way people around the world can understand that stuff. Um, And then also... You know, we're we're gonna talk about consistency a little later. Okay, sorry about that. I you thought were... that was going towards the idea of minimizing information access. No, well, yeah, the fact that it's a small screen does, but the fact that it's consistent, mm-hmm. that does not. That's a little bit different. All right. So the next the next piece of the puzzle mm-hmm. of these thirteen design principles, uh, th- this is the proximity compatibility principle. Okay. Proximity compatibility principle. All right. All right. You got it? Yeah. All right, good. So the next one, uh, you're not even going to stop me. You got it, right? Like, you're just picking up this info. Like, you're, okay, you're getting so the it. Okay, proximity Look, compatibility principle. Really quick. That one's... The, wait. PCP? Whoa. Let me stop for a second. The reason why I wanted to just go on is because you're you're skipping ahead. And that's such a good thing. I feel so happy right now <laughs> because you are putting these pieces together and you're you're oh. figuring it out. 
and and you got okay. You, you already figured out that we're sorcerers, and you know that <laughs> consistency is coming up next. The black robes and everything. Okay, so yeah, that's talking about what the we black were just robes, talking about. The black robes are de- graduation gowns, but uh, anyway. So all right, I knew it. All right, so proximity compatibility principle. Uh-huh. What is that? Okay, so let's break it down. Proximity, right? How uh, where it is, how how close it is to something else, right? Right. Compatibility, how how well it fits with that, right? Uh, and principle. So breaking it down like that, right? You have divided attention um, between two sort of pieces of information, right? And and that might actually be necessary uh, to complete a task, right? So so having these uh, having this information separated mm-hmm. could be good having this information together could be good um and so they uh like like things that go together should be um close together on the display right is that why we um when we have things like wireless keyboards and things like that right we always still put it underneath the monitor um you know because i notice like people have offices right and they have screens, and you can always tell what their dominant screen is for, like, typing things, sending emails, or stuff like that, because the keyboard's usually in front of that screen. Maybe. That might have something to do with it. Um, think about displays. Wouldn't that be considered a display? Because how the machine is? Like, when they were doing a typewriter, wouldn't that be considered a display? Well, let's go back to what displays are, right? This is this is some sort of presentation of information. Ah, you're right. Uh, ah, you're right. Now, because the now, keyboard's not telling you anything. It it tells you what keys you're pressing, and that in in that sense, it's a display for the keys. But most people know how to type without. I get you. So, okay. really, that's in your head. But the actual display is what's on the screen. So, no, we're talking about uh, you know basically just you want things that go together to be together. On the screen. Mm-hmm. So, also, you want to be careful of not to clutter the screen, mm. right? You know, too much stuff on the screen can can be so much. It's it could be so noisy that you're just you don't know where to look. Right. right? I see that a lot in like four X games that always <laughs> happen out there because it's like I don't know where all this technology information is supposed to be. Right. And so, you know, part of this has to do with the mental model, um, but it's it's mostly based on attention, right? And so, um, yeah, basically you want to put together some buttons that have some sort of similar functionality, mm-hmm. um, you know, together, and then you want to uh, maybe pair things that have similar colors or patterns, um, and, and, and really this... This kind of, I mean, they all link together, but this links in really nicely with, um, you know, minimizing information access cost because the the cost of accessing similar information is low when you put it all together, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if you're going to be looking at the same stuff anyway, you might, might as, well. as well, might as well, yeah. And and so you you minimize that cost. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. I get it. I get it. <sighs> Good. I'm glad you're getting it. Now, I'm, I'm getting it too. <laughs> I hope you do. <laughs> <laughs> you know those mechs aren't going to design themselves. <laughs> uh, mechs. T- what what would you call like a wizard mech? Is that like a thing in? Oh God, no, 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 no fan. I mean, they try to do hard fiction. I mean, as hard fiction as you can get nowadays. Wasn't there like a series that did wizard mechs? I think there was that 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 I don't know anime. But there was that anime series that did that, didn't it? I don't know. Like Gundam Wing? Is that is that Magic Mechs? I think so. But Japanese are weird because it's like, I'm piloting a spacecraft, but I believe in myself so the spacecraft can do amazing things. If you find, like, sorcerer Wiccan mech drivers, <laughs> let me know. Because <laughs> uh, I'll get right on that. Are we going to get you a little leather jacket with a patch on it so you can be part of that? Yes. <laughs> Make it say human factors cast across the back. Oh, dude, that'd be metal. We gotta get patches. We gotta get sweet patches. Oh man, with our logo design and everything. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Would you guys be interested in any type of product placement? T shirts, patches, things like that? Let us know on the Facebook. <laughs> Let us know. Alright, so we're moving on to principle of multiple resources. Alright. Uh, I get this one. Oh, you got this one? This is the idea of like basically different things. Like um, 
like always in the movies, red lights start flashing, but there's also noise flashing. What am I even doing here? Billy, <laughs> take it away. Yeah. Take it no, away. No, no, no. I mean, like, it's just principles of multiple resources. We've talked about the idea that everything here is kind of like a principle of design, but multiple resources seems like it would be using multiple things. Like, right. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, when you're designing something, you uh, you... Yeah, the red lights flash, but you also want redundancy, right? And that was another one of our principles, mm-hmm. redundancy gain. Present it in multiple ways. Right. I never understood why there was a big loud horn going and red lights flashing because it's like, yeah, we know. Well, yeah, but I mean, if you're not looking at the red light flashing or you can't see it because you've blacked out, but you can still hear. Oh. You know, there's, you, you, it's red alert. You want something. Right, right, right. Star Trek yeah. style. Yeah, and so, um, you, you know, and, and the idea behind this is that it uses different resources in your brain. Like, you use different resources to process auditory information uh-huh. than you do to process visual information. And so, you know, pr- simultaneously presenting these things, you can, uh, you create that redundancy. Um, and it has to do with the multimodality that we talked about a couple weeks ago, right? Remember with the virtual environments? Vir- environments versus virtual worlds. Type? Yeah, yeah. yeah um, and we talked about multimodality where uh-huh. you have different inputs, right? So basically this is providing you with different inputs. Mm. Um, you know, like a fighter jet pilot will have the red lights flashing. They'll have the alarm sounding. Their joystick if will be... If the machine decides to. No. <laughs> Check out our automation episode for that Heck one. Heck yeah. Oh, That's man. callback. That's a callback. No, but their joystick haptically will be gy- uh, 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 vibrating as well if they like stall the plane. Right. right? So it'll say, hey, hey, hey. Get on this! Like, Wait, that's automated. That's not uh, just a thing because of like wind resistance against the 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 wings and stuff like that. They can, yeah. That's that's simulated. That's yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. It'll like start... in my mental model, that was because of the that's resistance. That's because of the resistance of the wing, and they were and they put that in there for that reason. Like, hey, no, they're all fly by wire now. Really? Yeah. Huh. Did not know that. You're learning something every <laughs> week here on Human Factors Cast. All right. So yeah. So basically, um, yeah, yeah. So mm. okay. So. so so another example of that, right, uh-huh. uh, would be like a map showing you a city name, mm. right, uh, and and some speech saying you are 500 feet from your destination, right. Uh-huh. So you can you can see it and you can hear that you're getting close as well. Mm. Right, um, and and that would be uh, the idea with the multiple resource principle is that it accesses different pools of resources in your brain, uh-huh. and so you're seeing the map, and you're hearing this information, and that's different from if you were seeing the map and reading that text on there because your visual system would be reading that text instead of looking at the map. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. It's kind of like the idea of language and subtitles. Yeah, so when there's subtitles on the screen, you're not looking at what's going on. You're reading the subtitles. Right, right. That's why some people have problems with, like, um, foreign films where a lot is going on right on the screen because it takes you away from the subtitles. Or multiple people are talking at the same time. Right. But we use principle of multiple resources to color code the subtitles and put them in different places. Yeah. Yes. Getting this. You got it. All right. So those were principles based on attention, right? And right. now we are moving on to um, the memory principles. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. So memory principles. What do you think these have to deal with? Uh, well, we talk about when we talk about heuristics, it's the idea of like making uh memory type of movements like uh like on a phone and things like that i know if i push this button this is what it'll do but it doesn't take a lot of memory to do it right i'm i just continuously get impressed by (laughs) the amount of knowledge that you have absorbed over these last eight episodes billy i am really impressed oh so i'm kind of on the right track here you are definitely on the right track yeah so um let's let's start with uh with replacing memory with visual information knowledge in the world right now there's this there's this idea of knowledge in the world versus knowledge in your head okay okay 
if I tell you a phone number, uh -huh. can you remember it easily? Well, after a few times probably saying it in my head, I bet I could, right? Now, how easy would it be for you to remember if you were looking at a display that had it right on the screen? Like, would it go away after a little while, or is it just always no. on the screen? It's just, it's just right there. It's just displayed on the screen. Well, I wouldn't really have to remember it, though, would I? That's the point. Okay. So why would we tax our users uh, cognitively by making them remember something that we can show them on the screen? Mm, okay. That's, okay. That's what we're getting at here, right? Yeah, so this idea can be really valuable in sort of, you know, providing the user with information that they shouldn't have to remember in their head. Okay. Now, that's, that's, not, that's not it. There's more. <laughs> right. But wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. If you act now, um, on Human Factors Cast. Uh -huh. uh, okay, so the more part of it is yes, you've put information into the system that they can look at and reference at will. Now, this should be information that is hard for them to remember. Mm -hmm. This should be information that they will need to accomplish their task. Now, there still should be information that they can keep inside their head. Mm -hmm. Right now, this is this is knowledge in the world versus knowledge in the head, and so the knowledge in the head has to complement the knowledge that you would have on these displays, right? So, for example, like um, like if you're if you're an expert in some program and and you're executing commands to run it, right? Mm -hmm. The commands themselves you would probably remember. Uh, you wouldn't want to put those on the screen because that would take up and that would take up screen space and add clutter, right? But um, basically, you would be reading a manual if you had that information on the screen. Mm, okay, okay. You know? and, and, and chances are, they have already committed this stuff to memory because they, they do it all the time. Now, the stuff that you would want on the screen is, is stuff that is pertinent to the task. Now, I, in this hypothetical situation, I don't know what the task could be and I don't know what the information could be. But the point is, you want it relevant to what they're doing, but not to overlap with what they kind of already know in their head. Okay, yeah, yeah. Like, um, I mean, we can see examples of this in video games. Sure, give us an example. Well, like, for example, it's traditional that L3 is run. You are getting so far ahead, and I, I love that you're getting Oh, I'm so sorry. No, no, no. It's, it's okay. It's like L3 is usually run, but in No Man's Sky, it's R3, and it drives a lot of people insane. Well, what, so what, what information is on the screen in that example? What information is displayed? What? What do you mean? We're talking about... Oh, on the screen, uh, it well, it's... Uh, you know what? I'm getting back to a controller again. I keep doing that. You are. What's on the display? We're talking about displays. So, if you could think of an example, right, that we just talked about. So, again, we're talking about having that knowledge on the screen versus having the knowledge in your head. Okay, so, like, for example, when you're doing PC stuff, like, E is usually an interact button, so they always see an E everywhere, so you instinctually know where it is and what you're pushing. Sure. Um, what I think of when I think of video games is typically tutorial levels. Oh, okay. You see, yeah, yeah, yeah. You see an overlay of the controller saying, hey, press this button. Right, right. But okay. once you're used to it, that's knowledge in your head, and then knowledge that is pertinent to, you know, what what's next in the game, advancing in the game, is shown on the screen. You don't get to see that controller control all the time on mm -hmm. the screen. So so that would be an example that I would think of in relation to video games. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, we're almost to your favorite part. I, I swear we're almost there. <laughs> and then you can talk about it all you want. All you want. I promise. We just got to make it through one more. Okay. <laughs> now, principle of predictive aiding. Uh-huh. This is cool. So there's a whole field. Um dedicated to decision support systems. Now, what I mean by that is imagine you have to make a decision in a split second or, or a couple seconds that you have to cap, uh, factor in like hundreds of thousands of variables. 
let's say, let's say, um, you are uh, a a commercial airline pilot. All right. All right. Captain Billy Hall. Flying that plane. Flying the plane. Not going to put it in the Hudson, but one, I'm flying that plane. One of your engines goes out. Oh, nuts. All okay. right. So there's probably a million things running through your head. Did mm-hmm. I just hit something? Did Was it a machine machinery failure? Uh, was it... Pilot error. Pilot error. Was it me? Did I do something? Like, these are just three of millions of factors that could have affected this, right? Mm-hmm. And so... You basically have to say, okay, so what what happened, and now what am I going to do, right? And you have to interpret all this information, all these factors. In a split second. In, well, yeah, because if not, you're going to fall out of the sky. Am I right? Right. Okay, so we're talking about principle of predictive aiding. Now, what this does is you want to give the user some sort of proactive... Um, feedback right uh that um so so what i was mentioning earlier decision support system that's kind of like what happens after the fact but the predict predictive would be like uh you're coming in too low for a landing Mm -hmm. so uh before you crash i'm going to (laughs) before i die horribly if you stay on this path you're gonna crash but you know like provide a display that says angle up a little bit and you'll be okay. Mm-hmm. Right? So it's predicting... Reduce speed, it's, angle up. It's basically intercepting that error that you are likely to commit if you are if you keep going on this path and saying, hey, 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 wait, 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 you should probably do this. Um, so basically, it should... Uh, one, of, one of... This principle is basically saying that it should eliminate... Uh, sort of these resource, resource demanding, um, you know, tasks that someone that an operator or user is uh, experiencing, and replace them with something easy to understand, right? Mm. Mm-hmm. Like instead of saying, "Oh, I don't know if I'm coming in too shallow," say, "I'm coming in too shallow," and offer a solution, right? Right, right, that's, right. That's we hear about these sort of things a lot of times, you know, reduce speed, things like that, right? Uh, you know, there, there's, like the stoplight, there's an example that you see every day. Uh, the speed trap when driving. Explain. How well, is that a, how is well, that like, a for example, aid? if he wants you to reduce speed, you're coming up to the speed trap. Well, not a, it's not a speed trap. It's a speed monitor. It's speed enforced? Yeah, the speed enforced thing that shows you a little digital display of your speed. If you're going too fast, it shows you the speed before you get there, starts blinking, like reduce speed, reduce speed. Like, you're going too fast, slow down on this turn. That's a good example. I was thinking of, like, the signs that tell you how far away to a city you are. Oh, okay. Right? Okay, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that gives you information, right? Or, or like, or traffic road, ahead. Just road signs in general. Like, if you, if you stay in this lane, you're going to go straight. If you stay in that lane, you're going to turn left. If you go this way, you're going to go on the, the north freeway. Your GPS tells you these things. Yeah, but road signs are the predictive Oh, I right? see, I They're, see. You're yeah. right, you're right, you're right. Okay, okay, yeah. Or, uh, you know, something like a, a dotted line on the road says, hey, there's going to be a turn coming up. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, So mm-hmm. it's, yeah, it's just these, like, these little things that come into it that say, hey, look, like, there's something coming up. You should probably pay attention. <laughs> Number 13. Number number thirteen, the evil one. This is not evil. This is your favorite one. This so, is the one that opens the pentagram to computer hell. Computer bliss. If you, ah, if you, that's exactly what an evil warlock would say. Well, no. If you followed all these principles, you should have an excellent product, right? Maybe <laughs> usability test. You're Do right. All the you're design right. Things that we talked right. about. You're right. Everything needs to be in a uniformed, idealistic way, just like the weaver intended. All right. The few fans that got that joke, those fans, solid fans. All right. So, I'm going to let you do the honors. What is number 13, Billy? 13 is the principles of consistency. It's the idea of one thing being like another thing being like another thing. So, we immediately understand what's going on. Like the ATMs we were talking about of where everything is placed. Like the idea that R3 is always run. 
You know, and when they come up there and when they don't do it, it messes with our juju. Or the idea of, like, an on switch is on and an off switch is off. Up and down. These are universal things that we all understand. Dang. That was a high five that was from a the five. scientist. I got a high five from a scientist. That hasn't happened to me until since high school. Man. So, so the science that's going on behind that, uh-huh. right? Obviously, that makes sense at face value, mm, right? Mm, do mm, things mm. the same, you're likely to do it. So the science behind it is habits, right? Mm-hmm. Human beings are habitual beings. They'll do things in routines, and they'll, they'll get used to something one way, and it'll be hard for them to break that habit. That's why when you make run L3, and you map it to R3, uh, and it doesn't quite... It doesn't jive. No, it doesn't. So... Uh, that it's probably still the reason why America is still on this system of measurement that we are on. Yeah, it's exactly because it's our it, well. Yeah, it, that is our consistency. Like mm-hmm. if we deviate, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah, I mean it's totally broken, but but let's, still. Anyway, so ignore it until it's broken, broken, broken. <laughs> Yeah, until it causes, like, millions and millions of dollars of, of problems, and then we'll fix it. Yeah, that, that's the American but, way. But only then. That's when it becomes worth it. So, <laughs> all right. So, so the other science that's going on here is that we have short-term memory and long-term memory, and there's the processes that go into it, and, and uh, we should probably do an episode on memory. I'm going to write that down right now, because memory is really interesting. Uh, so you can remember it. Uh... See, okay, really quick, what I'm doing here when I write down these show ideas, yeah. I'm putting knowledge in the world versus knowledge in my head. Uh-huh. Because now I don't have to remember these. I can just look at them. And this is my display. This is my upcoming podcast list. Display. The little list, the, the, the hastily jaunted notes. I Man, dig it. We have, we have a ton of lists. But if you guys are interested in any topic, let us know. We'd be more than happy to move that up. If you're itching to talk about something or you have a question for us, just let us know. But anyway, so we're talking about consistency, right? Mm-hmm. We have the short-term memory and long-term memory, and there's some magic that goes on in between those two, which we should talk about in a memory episode, which is why I just wrote it down. But basically, once you know you have these consistencies, they've moved into the long-term memory um, they they basically trigger actions that the user just does out of habit, mm-hmm. right? And so once they do this out of habit, uh, then then they're they're more likely to complete their task if the product is designed to meet those needs, mm. right? So um, yeah, a design basically must accept it, right? If they try to break that mold, mm-hmm. if they try to do something different, you're gonna have a hard time. Huh. Okay. Right. That's the idea. Like, I mean, and it kind of affects on everything that you're doing there. People will get upset about this. People will rage about this, especially on the internet. Yeah. Why isn't it like this? Why can't it be simple? Why can't we all just use USB cords to charge our phones? Yeah. 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 I mean, like, is there a reason? Is there efficiency? Or you just, and then people will get mad. Are you just doing this to make us buy your thing? Are you just making it so that we only use your product? Right. And But when me, people make concessions, we don't ever notice it hardly. You know, the habits. So the habits part of it is really interesting, right? Because we do things instinctually and it mm-hmm. just kind of happens. There's also another component to it, too, which is, like, iconography. Now, this is, like, making the floppy disk icon always save. Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. Even mm-hmm. though the floppy disk is extinct... Like, the idea of the phone call on a cell phone. Like, when's the last time you picked up a regular transceiver like that? It's still, yeah, it's still shaped yeah, like, like one a of those, phone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's those ideas of, you know, these have been the standards, so we're going to carry them forward and use them again because it helps the users recognize what's going on. And that's also knowledge in the world versus knowledge in your, your head. head. Ah, it all comes back it's around. It's not like you have to remember what this new icon is. No. I mean, sometimes they will introduce new icons and it like really trips them up, but if it's a good icon, it'll stick. Just like the metric system. The idea of the cell... I, I would imagine that our phone, 30, 40 years from now, when all we have our cell phone, is still going to be that little sucker right there with the phone thing. Or when we come up with digital keyboards where it just knows what we're going to be typing. 
it's still going to look like a keyboard. You know, I just thought of another predictive aid. Mm. When you're typing on your phone now, a lot of the keyboards will actually, like, say, it, it, like, okay, so in my phone, if I type in human, mm-hmm. the next word that, like, shows up in the predictive display is factors. Mm. Yeah, yeah, And yeah, then yeah. if I hit that, it'll just automatically type it <laughs> to save me the trouble. Right. And then it'll show cast. I mean, it's just, or, or like that ring that they're trying to get on there. You know, the ring that they're trying to do where you kind of just go this way and that way to do letters. You know, have you seen that thing online? So that's like a gestural-based uh, Keyboard, yeah. So you can have two of them, and you can type a lot faster because you know it's pre- so predictive, apparently. They haven't patented figured out the technology yet from what okay i'm watching you do this and i'm going to describe it for the listeners billy is literally sitting here waving his hands like jazz hands yep but those aren't spirit fingers okay he's waving them like jazz hands yeah in front of him and this goes back to i can't remember if it was this week or last week that we talked about uh minority reports displays oh this was right? last week that we talked about that yeah was yeah that? yeah yeah right. so for those of you listening, it's been a week since we last met, so I couldn't, I can't remember. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you doing that, though, makes me think, wow, that display is going to make people tired really quick. If they're moving their hands like this, I'm getting tired just doing it now. But think about it this way, though. If we start doing this when you're, like, 10, when you're 10 years old and we start doing this. So we have 10-year-olds with really, like, big biceps, like, and, think about and it, triceps though. holding up their arms. Think about it. The idea of the of the perfect world of automation goes in that direction, and it all starts with you. The only reason we know how to type is because of the fact that we've been typing since, like, third grade. Let me tell you a sad, sad story about a console called the Wii. All right. How many videos have you seen of people playing the Wii where they're sitting on the couch just going, like, waving, waving the Wii mote? But how know? old are those people? I mean, yes, you get but, some of the younger people, but watch how many ones that you see kids playing the Wii where they're getting really what I, into it. What I'm saying is that it's it's a novel idea, mm-hmm. and it might work for some people, but I don't... It depends. How is your H, uh, um, How is your VR set up at your house doing? It's, Same concept. Well, yeah, I don't have any of the the... Movement control set up yet. We'll see when I get PlayStation VR. That's something I want to review uh, on I this wanna, show. I really want to get one, too. Like, I've been thinking about the idea of, like, okay, i got to get rid of this desk that I never use. i got to get rid of this stuff right here because I need to be able to make enough space you for the VR. You don't need, They recommend a lot of room, but you really don't need a whole lot of room. If you sit down on your couch or your chair or whatever and play, you should be okay. Yeah, but don't you have to set up, like, parameters of walls? No. Oh, okay. You'll be all right. All, all right. right. So I think that well that's it. I yeah. mean that was that was a lot dude, that was a big episode. I'm excited about it. That was a big episode. The plural. Yeah, no, I feel full of knowledge. Do you feel full okay, that's good. So yeah. if you were to design something, which I think you're designing something but you don't want to say on the podcast yet, right? No, because you're, I don't want to be that guy until I have something there. You're pretty humble about it. But Billy's <laughs> making something and it's pretty cool I've seen it. So I'm gonna I'm not going to say what it is. I'm going to respect his wishes there. <laughs> I'm just going to say that he's working really hard on something. I've and, been working on it. And I know he's been taking these into consideration since we started the podcast. And I know it will be a better product because of this. <laughs> and I'll be more receptive to these points because I'll be able to meet you on solid ground about it. But yeah. until then, let's tell each other and tell everybody about who we are. All right. So that's it for today. Mm-hmm. All right. We're all done. If you guys want to be featured on our show, yeah, right, we didn't take questions this week because we had so much to cover and we broke it into two episodes. If you guys want to be featured on our show, we're all over social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever. Uh, you can go ahead and comment on our SoundCloud, Facebook. I just said it all. Go ahead and send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. If you want us to look at something or to review something or talk about something that you might be creating, please. If you have a story, a us. question, anything, just yeah. give us an email. Anecdote. Uh, be sure to like and follow us and review us on iTunes, the Google Play Store, SoundCloud, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. Mine's Podcast Addict. We're always trying to keep in touch with you guys. So like Billy said earlier, if you have any topics that you want us to talk about on the show, let us know. I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn.com slash Nick Rome. That's with two O's. Billy Hall, where can they find you? 
They can find me on Twitter or streaming on YouTube at Comstar Cleric. Thanks so much again for listening to us here on Team Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends. Hey guys, it's Nick. If you like what we're doing on the show and want to support us, you can go to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash Cast. Support us on Patreon, and we'll answer your questions on the show. We'll address a topic that you, yes, you, one that you choose. E will even advertise your product with us and much, much more. Everything that you guys donate to us, though, goes directly into the production of the show, and we always appreciate it when someone helps us out. So go check us out on patreon.com slash humanfactorscast today. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you guys next week.